Today, I get to talk to my friend Martin Chan. Martin studied a philosophy major and ended up teaching himself how to code because he wanted to automate repetitive tasks he was doing. He started with Excel VBA and now works as a consultant utilizing R programming and a number of other tools to conduct analysis on survey data. We talk about how Martin managed to develop these skills despite not coming from a programming background. Some of the benefits open source tools such as R have over some other tools such as Excel and SPSS. We also discuss some of the concerns people may have over open source tools and when it may make sense to use other tools instead. There's a ton of great content here. To help you find your way around, I've added an index in the description, which contains the different sections in case you want to jump around. I'm planning to have more conversations with other industry professionals across different sectors. So please let me know in the comments what would be valuable to you. In the meantime, I hope you really enjoy this talk with my friend Martin Chan. If you're new to this channel and you're keen to learn the latest tips, tricks, and tools for working more effectively with data, please hit the subscribe button for weekly videos. All right, so I'm here with my friend Martin here today. Martin is a consultant at uh, Rainmakers and he uses a lot of R to do some analytics on surveys and different things like that. So we're gonna be talking about a whole ton of interesting things like how Martin got into R uh, from actually a philosophy background, right? Yep. So um, really interesting story there. And uh, also how he transitioned from using things like Excel and Excel VBA into R as well. Yep. So. Well, thanks for having me here. Jonathan. Yeah, great to, great yep. to have you here. Yeah. So um, yeah, do tell. Um, you, uh, a little bit more about your work and yes, uh, so sure um so uh, i work at, as jonathan said i work at a company called rainmaker csi so to summarize what our business does is that we help our clients solve uh, strategic questions and um, each question can be quite ad hoc and quite unique so it's very much driven by um the circumstance so let me give you a couple of examples that would include helping identify for our clients what's the best growth strategy, what's their most valuable customers, and uh, say, what are the possible most disruptive trends that's happening in the market. And um, it really depends on what sort of data they've got. So I would say sometimes we work with uh, their own survey data, something yeah. that sits uh, within their own um, systems. Sometimes it would be looking at um, third party or public, well, data in the public realm basically okay and uh, sometimes we also do like primary research for them which means we help them run their own sort of surveys yeah and um, and not just surveys because surveys are probably referred to the quantitative um, data but we also do like depth interviews and also um, sometimes social media mining so it comes okay. with a myriad of different things oh, so um, it's interesting because R is um, a language that's very well equipped to deal with. It's very versatile, so we've got packages to deal with all sorts of problems. And uh, I guess what I do is um, to look at what's available with their data, to look at what their strategic ultimate end goal is as a problem, and try to connect those two dots and help them solve the problem. And R is the main tool that I use for that. All right, fantastic. Yeah, because yeah, so, um, I mean, there's a there's a lot of different tools these days, mm -hmm. right? So I understand that your team also uses some other tools like yes. SPSS yep. and um, some yeah, Excel, Excel and some different Excel, things yeah. like that. So, so. Um, I guess when we say, um, so one, one of the main tools that, the, the other main tool that we use um, apart from Excel, which is the universal tool for yes. analysis, is, uh, is a software called Q. So mm. basically it's a, a software specialized for uh, market research survey analysis. Okay. And it, um, the reason we also say that it's SPSS because it operates mainly on SPSS files, so right, SAF right. files. And what, what it is basically, it's, um, it's a point and click software. Yep. And um, like SPSS, you can um, generate cross tables and run analysis. Mm. But how Q positions itself and how we understand it is that it's like a, almost a boosted or enhanced version of SPSS. So um, 
it's you know with SPSS you need to buy these upgrades, but with Q it's got all of these already um, included in it, so you can do cluster analysis, mm. regressions, and um, key driver analysis. That's all inside Q. But I mean, if you want to look for more for it, it's called Q Research Software because if you okay. search for Q, it comes up with all sorts of results. So yeah. that's the main tool. Uh, Excel is the other main tool. And um, for anything that sort of goes beyond survey analysis a little bit more, we use R. Yeah. And although more recently, I found myself, um, even if it's to do with survey analysis, yeah. I would try to use R because there are benefits of unique benefits to R, which is like um, reproducibility mm. and also the fact that, um, say, something that, or, or scalability, say if you're trying to analyze it, for a lot of subsegments, Q because essentially it's point and click. Right. You can't scale that well. Yes. Whereas R, if you've embedded that inside a function, you can yeah, run as yeah, many no, times absolutely. as you want, and that that's a huge benefit. Yeah. So yeah. that I mean, I guess that's one of the real benefits of moving over to something like code, mm -hmm. like R, where yeah. you can basically build a function, parameterize it, and then mm -hmm. reuse it again in lots of different ways. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. That's, that's a real yeah. key benefit there. Yeah. And um, aside from that, uh, are there any kind of particular libraries that you're using within R? Uh, yeah, for your so kind of R, I mean, I guess, I guess the staple of R is right, tid tidyverse, tidyverse, right? Yes. Because um, absolutely, um, I guess, I guess it's still useful to state why because tidyverse, um, it's got a consistent syntax, so that uh, when you're trying to use some of the packages mm. inside tidyverse it's predictable so you wouldn't have arguments in the odd places yeah and uh it's very readable so one of the things that i've been doing within my team is to sort of um, share or teach or, or get everyone to use r a little bit more and i find it really useful to um introduce tidyverse as a first um style of r yes. as opposed to base r because it becomes so easy to understand and just as an example say if you're trying to um, you've got a data set, you're trying to filter it, select some columns um, and calculate by groups what are the mm. respective means of it. So you can do all those with um, um, filter, select, group by and summarize. Yep. And you can use it to pipe it and it becomes really easy to read. Whereas yep. if you're trying to do it in base R, you'd have um, four, yeah, four all five the kind of square brackets, brackets and, and then it just like becomes uh, really hard to understand what you've been doing. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's so, yeah. a really nice thing about Tidyverse, right? Is yeah. that it's, it's readable. Like, even if you've never seen the language before, you can kind of look at it and it can kind of make yeah. sense, right? Because uh, they're just kind of, uh, kind of sensible words, yeah. like select, group by, uh, and summarize. Also, and also pipes as well. You can read it as um, then. Yes. So, like, each pipe is a then statement. So, it's almost um, very human readable, I yes. guess is what you would say. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Especially when, you know, when you're doing like real life analysis, right? Mm -hmm. um, your data starts to become like a little bit more complicated and you want to yeah. do more steps to it. And being able to incrementally add a little bit, a little bit, a little bit extra each time mm -hmm. um, makes it really easy to gradually yeah. go back your logic. Yeah, that, that is right. Yeah. So, yeah, just going back to your question because you asked about what other packages we use. So, yeah. um, all those tidyverse packages that includes a dplyr, tidyr, and um, ggplot too as well for understanding what's um, like what's happening with the with the data. We also I also used I've also used other packages which are, are quite I suppose is quite uniquely interesting to our line of yep. analysis, which I've also talked about in um, one of the old conferences that I've been to, yep. which is uh, RQDA which stands okay. for um, R for Qualitative Data Analysis. Yes. So, um, I don't know, because sometimes, say, if you've got interviews, so they're like an hour long or two hour long interviews or um, focus groups, you, all you get that is are these transcripts. Yes. And say, of course, like, if you come from a sort of um, data science background, where say, let's text analyze it, let's yes. check for uh, word frequencies and all that. But sometimes... Um, I mean, sometimes it's still useful to go through that manually and then to identify for themes and then uh, to see what's really the story and the narrative that's coming up because mm. that might come through in dialogue rather than in text or um, phrase frequencies. Right. So um, 
historically, like how that was done in our yeah. industry, is that you'd have these transcripts as word documents. You read through it, and then mentally you'd be trying to um, see what themes are coming up, group them, and then um, you just sort of write out your story in PowerPoint. So our QDA is funny. So it's uh, a GUI interface within R. Okay. So when you run that library, it starts up this interface that lets you um, code and highlight text bits. Yeah. Um, but although that process is manual, what it does basically it's creating a SQLite database okay. within that within that environment, and then having done that, because what you're basically doing you're trying to turn a unstructured qualitative text into something that's got a structure. Yeah. And after that, you can do your your statistical data analysis on that. Okay. So um, I quite like the idea of a package that's quite yeah. new to me. I know there are commercial pa uh, software that do it, like Envivo. Like I think that's used in a lot of psychology courses when you're doing right. qualitative analysis. But being able to do that in R means that it's not locked into a particular software. Mm. It means that, say, I can run correlations on that if I want to. Yes. I can run, um, what is it, word clouds on that if I want to. So that that's really powerful. But I know that's quite a, a niche um, because that's not like yeah, that, yeah that, that's no, kind of I mean, counterintuitive. Kind of interesting interesting yeah. Like, why wouldn't you use start using NLP or something more? Yeah, like, like libraries learning, like tidy yeah. text and but, things like that. Yeah. And, yeah, but I guess that's what I like about R because it's got almost a package of anything that you can think of. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's something. I think there's like sixteen thousand libraries oh, yeah. in R now. Yeah. So it's just an absolute massive amount of libraries. Yeah. And so I think a lot of times when you're starting a piece of work, right, mm -hmm. you don't need to start building stuff from scratch. I mean, probably yes. the first thing you're going to do is look to see if there's a package available. Yeah, because definitely. whether you can use that package or not, you mm -hmm. can at least get some ideas. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's always a, a really great starting point. Yeah. Right? yeah it saves a lot of work. Yeah. And um, I think that's uh, probably that's uh, another thing that we're talking about uh -huh. is R compared to some of the other tools like yes. SPSS and yeah. things like that. And I think that's another real advantage, right? Yeah. Because, well, when you have these kind of commercial packages like mm -hmm. MATLAB, SPSS, yeah. and all these other tools, every extension that you want mm -hmm. is a really expensive module that you need to yeah, buy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess that that is a really valid point because it's not just about money. It's also because, say, if you're working in an organization, yeah, you'd have to go back to a more to a more senior level to get permission to install it and yes. then IT and all that. And I guess R being open source means that, so open source is one thing, it's free. So it saves you the time of um, yes. getting permission, but it also means that um, because it's open source, it means that you can experiment much more freely. Yes. So um, the it means that say if you're not sure what approach you you want to try to solve a particular problem yeah. you can just you know download yeah. it on your computer try different versions of it and then decide what you want rather than buy it and then realize you don't yeah and really then want it, it doesn't work right yeah or or, yeah. or trial it i guess and then install on your computer so you end up with loads of <laughs> useless yeah, software no, absolutely. in your computer so uh, yeah no absolutely advantage. because uh, one of the things is if you're working in a, a large organization and you need to get these packages. It's these massive long approval processes mm -hmm. to get the thing paid for and s installed yeah. and everything like that. And like you said, it could turn out that it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of that iteration and experimental process. Yeah. Whereas if you're using commercial software, maybe it will cost you 15 grand mm -hmm. and six months to even yeah. try something. Whereas with R, you know, you've downloaded and installed the package in like five mm -hmm. minutes. Yeah. And then, you know, often maybe there's five different packages. Yeah that do the same sort of thing, but they do them in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. And one of those is going to fit your solution better than others. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a real powerful yeah, benefit. Definitely. I mean, like one of the real life examples for that is um, my experience with uh, the qualitative yeah. data analysis that I talked about, mm -hmm. because uh, mm -hmm. I think in that particular use case was back in my um, older company, which did market research. So we were an analyzing uh, employee engagement studies. And uh, we were first trialing a, a, a sort of a, a method of analyzing what people were typing out in uh, in interviews. And then uh, we started trialing en vivo. And yeah. then for trialing for two weeks, we realized that yes. it's all locked in, so we can't mm. actually analyze the data. And then we started looking at different packages available in R, yeah. and we found something that worked for us. Yeah. So yeah, that's just um, that's cool. For that. 
Yeah. And um, let's talk about a few other things, actually. Yeah. So now some of the concerns people have mm -hmm. when moving over to something like R. Yeah. So some of them um, we were talking about earlier was the fact that it is open source. And yeah. so, you know, what is the quality control on mm -hmm. these different libraries and, and different things like that, right? Yeah. So, so I guess um, one of the concerns, I, I can't see where the concerns come from because if there's think of it, you tr introduce, oh, I say it's an open source statistical language. And then people think open source and like, okay, so is that like uh, Wikipedia, right? So yeah. anyone can just come in, write a package, edit it. And uh, what if um, they're not really good at what they're doing, say if yes. they don't know how to treat missing values, it's just impute it with something that's not reasonable, mm. um, how would you deal with it? And um, I would say that in a way, yes, it is like Wikipedia, is, as in like it is open, like everyone can use it, it's free. Uh, but I would also say that not just anyone would just come and write an R package. Yes. And um, it's almost like um, those who come to the, to the community to write a package are normally quite uh, knowledgeable. Mm. And um, aside from that, in order to get your package up to a crime register archive where you have all the um, sort of official R packages, yep. they tend to be um, audited. Uh, there are very stringent checks on the, um, on the R package. And normally before a package is released on CRAN, it's spent some time on GitHub mm -hmm. where you would have uh, multiple contributors checking the code, people troubleshooting it. And um, I guess the question is like, the, the, I guess the issue is, with commercially available packages, if you have an issue and you report it, yeah, it takes a while for that to be integrated in a, yes. into into the code. Whereas with with R, say I've had issues with packages before, I notice it, and then I would just submit issue on GitHub. I would yeah. uh, liaise with the contributor directly, yeah, and then a new release or an answer comes back like in a matter of days sometimes within yeah. the hours depending if you're lucky or not. Yeah, but it's, yeah. yeah, it's much more responsive. So mm. I think no, it's a really new um, paradigm or way of looking at things. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there are, doubt, without a doubt, there's going to be concerns. But um, yeah. if you look I at mean, the... I, I think the thing is, though, is that some of these packages have been around for like a really long time now, right? Yeah, I mean, true. some of them ha have been developed for over a decade. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of the bugs, if any, have been like phased out yeah. already and like you said a lot of these um even though there's say sixteen thousand libraries mm -hmm. uh you know you're not going to use that many of them right yeah. you're going to use a, a few kind of key ones mm -hmm. and you know if you want to check something if you want to see how it works you can actually look at the code right yeah, you can actually true. get in and see exactly how it works yeah. if you want to do that uh, which is pretty powerful and it's pretty pretty amazing yeah so and also i guess you know. as uh, analysts you yourself would um check or have at least essential that the package yeah. is something that you need before you go and use it yes. and say so if you just t if you're someone who takes a random package off the internet just uses it without examining yeah. what it actually does it's kind of your own fault right yeah so um i mean in practice it is quite a secure way of um you know getting getting the analysis that you want yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And I think another concern that people have is that, well, you know, with some of these other tools like MATLAB mm -hmm. and SPSS, you've got all this commercial support, right? Yeah. And for a long time, R hasn't had that because it's been kind of open source mm -hmm. and everything. But now that's kind of starting to change as well, right? Because yeah. you've got these commercial players coming in like Microsoft, yeah. who've got these commercial distributions of R yeah. where they check all the packages yeah. and then they snapshot all the packages. So you've got... Um, you know, package management yeah. and everything like that, all kind of built in in yeah. a commercially supported product. What was it called? MRAN or something? Yeah, so, so Microsoft, MRAN, yeah. yeah, so Microsoft they've got the Microsoft got version of yeah. R. So they, Microsoft bought out uh, Revolutions R. Yes. And yeah. now they've built that into um, Microsoft Machine Learning yeah. uh, Studio or Microsoft Machine Learning Server and yeah. everything like that. So they've got, uh, there's got some really kind of great solutions there yeah. for people who, you know, for like organizations who do want more of that kind of commercial mm -hmm. support. Yeah. But the great thing is, is that, you know, with R, you can basically start for free, right? Yeah. So you can start for free, you can experiment very quickly, and then upgrade to a kind of more commercial solution, if that's what you need for your organization. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. also, yes, because you were talking about Microsoft and all that, I guess, say, um, 
if you're trying to convince your own company's internal stakeholders into mm. using our, I guess you could also explain all that that we've talked about. Yeah. But also the fact that all these um, big financial companies, the gov- the UK government uses it a lot. I've met yeah. a lot of people who use it. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, like all these big companies are embracing R as a new way of working with data. So, I mean, if everyone's using it, then certainly there's a bit of confidence of why you should be, well, convince you to um, use it as part of your analysis work- workflow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Although I, sh- I, I shouldn't say <laughs> that because others are using it, you should use it. But that's yeah, one of yeah. the arguments, isn't it? Like, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, you want to. I mean, you know, you want to use a tool because, well, one, it's good, but also it's got to have sufficient community support yeah. and sufficient support from, uh, I guess, commercial players. Yes. Uh, and everything yeah. to be able to use it. Yeah. Right? So I mean, I was talking to some friends the other day, mm-hmm. and they were like, some people were talking about things like, okay, well, you've got languages like Julia and stuff like yeah. coming out now, which are supposed to be, you know, like the best of like R plus Python combined yeah. <laughs> and all this kind of thing. Yeah. But it's like, well, yeah, maybe that's nice, but there's not enough people using it yet. Yeah. And so because of that, it's it just makes it like a really hard language to go to. And, yeah. And I think one of the key benefits of Julia at the moment is that, well, actually you can go and incorporate the other languages. Yeah. Like you can go back and use R and Python if you want to. Um, but then actually, why don't you just use R and Python? And if you use yeah. R mark- Markdown, um, well, actually you can incorporate R and Python yeah. and, and C and everything um, in that anyway, right? So I think <laughs> Yeah, I think that's impor- important. Uh, as in, um, like part of the idea, the part of the decision in choosing what language to use yeah. is um, whether, like how you how you apply it and how the code will be shared amongst maybe your clients mm. or your stakeholders or um, yeah. even your suppliers. Like you might have other analytics partners help doing the code for you. So if you have a common language, mm. like. A lot, of it's, a lot of it is about communication. That's why you put comments yes. in code is a good practice. Yes. So using the common language obviously makes it easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and, yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I, I, like on the way here, I read the post uh, on our blog, which is about um, how Reticulate, which is um, a new R package that helps mm. you look at R and Python and solves a lot of the problems in data science. And... Um, mm. Yeah, the idea that you can bring R and Python together in R Studio yeah. solves that. It's, well, it's kind of... Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting that because, I mean, the two, probably the two biggest languages right mm-hmm. now uh, is basically R and Python right? yeah. because I think it's, it solves this kind of problem that we've had that traditionally you've had the business who have used things like Excel mm-hmm. um, and maybe you've got a few stats guys who yeah. have used things like MATLAB SPSS and SAS, mm-hmm. right? And then on the other side, you've got the IT guys, yeah. right? Who may be using things like C, C Sharp, mm-hmm. Java, um, maybe Node or something yeah. like that to b- build applications, right? Yeah. And for a long time, there's been a really, really big gap between these kind of two fields. Mm-hmm. Now we've got like things like R and Python, which sit yeah. kind of very nicely uh, in the middle of all of this. It mm-hmm. allows businesses to actually, they're easy enough for like business users to be able to start to get into, yeah. but they also code. And so the IT guys know how to use them, how to support them yeah. and, um, and different things like that. Um, yeah. And uh, where was I actually going <laughs> with this? Um, yeah, but R and Python have different benefits, right? Yeah. So they've got, uh, they've got different strengths. I would say that R in general yeah. is very, very good for analytics because that's how it started. Right? Yes. And uh, so it's got uh, the best support for kind of statistical functions. Mm-hmm. Um, people who are moving across from Excel, uh, it's a much easier transition, I think, than it is to move to something like Pandas mm-hmm. and, yeah. and Python. Um, and it's got a really good reporting solution with our Markdown. Yeah. Right? I guess some of the things with Python is, is that because the tech companies are leading a lot of the developments in like things like machine learning and mm-hmm. everything, then they can, uh, and they basically develop Python interfaces for those first. Mm-hmm. So, but, which is another interesting thing because I think sometimes people think, okay, well, so Python is better for machine learning. Maybe yeah. you should go move over there. So, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But the thing is, is that you actually don't need a lot of those kind of more advanced yeah, machine yeah. learning things anyway, is, is the first part. And two, now that you can kind of integrate them, you can pu- pull those things in if you really need them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean yeah. So I, I guess I guess one of the one of the things is like being able to do 
R and Python sort of one interface does yeah. help, I guess. Yeah, no, no, yeah. absolutely. And, and I guess it, it, it removes that barrier where say um if you're someone who only knows R. Yes. Like um would you be assigned to a team of other people who only knows R as well? Say you shouldn't be assigning people because of what language they use. You should yeah. be assigning them based on the problem solving Yes. skills that they have and uh, removing the barrier is a great way because ultimately like with data science you're trying to solve a problem or yes. make a decision so it shouldn't be so focused on the language itself yes. i guess ultimately mm. so yeah, yeah no i think it's important like i mean amazon's kind of philosophy is that amazon's such a huge organization right and they want to bring in the best the best talent yeah. and the best talent often have different skills. They know different programming languages, mm -hmm. but somehow they all need to work together. Yeah. Right? So their philosophy is basically, okay, work in the language that you want, but then kind of build some API so that you can kind of, you know, so that everything can talk to each other. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I think there is definitely value in being able to have different languages, which are good at different things and having mm -hmm. people who have skills in different languages. Yeah. Um, but in saying that, I, I think, uh, so you came from let's let's go over to yeah. <laughs> uh, the the other side of things now. So you originally came from a, more of an Excel background, right? Yeah. So maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the benefits of moving over to something like R and how easy it is to move from say something yeah. like Excel to uh, so, R. Yeah. So I guess maybe it's useful to say a little bit about the the origin story of. Um, of um, how I got into all this. So yeah. uh, as you said, my background was not in programming, it's more uh, in studying philosophy and politics and yeah. economics. Um, so the reason how, why I got into programming was in uh, my first job was in uh, market research yeah. and I was more working there as a uh, sort of part-time then. And uh, one of the things I noticed was that a lot of the tasks at the time uh, were things which were more manual. Yes. I, I guess you could also say it's tedious, but it's a repetitive. So each yes. of the tasks has a really set structure. And then it relies on um, hiring more like recent graduates so yes. they can get a sense of what's going on. But that doesn't require a lot of, um, well, a lot of thinking yes, skills. Yes. Or, yeah. So what I found was, ah, like, um, I don't know any programming, but it looks like... Um, there's something called VBA. Let me yes. have a look because I see I've seen people use like these code interfaces on yes. Excel, and uh, uh, maybe I'll give it a go. So um, yeah. I started reading up on for loops and all that, and yep. tried to automate some of the process in uh, Excel. And um, to my surprise, it was quite easy to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once you understand the basics of a loop, yes. it's just basically repeating, and iterating. Uh, so that that started the whole thing. So um, after a couple of years, I sort of became quite familiar with VBA. And um, the reason why I moved to R was, um, I've heard people talk about it, like um, say if you want to advance, uh, mm. it's like nobody really uses VBA anymore. It's yes. like, uh, it's not being actively developed. Yeah. So okay, R seems interesting. Like why not yeah, yeah. give it a go at it? So uh, transitioning at the time, I think that was like, that was still like two or three years ago yeah. when tidyverse was not a word. It's, yeah, people was, used to call it um, Hadley first though. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I think at that time I, because the resources available yeah. at that time didn't really focus on um, deep player or pipes. And mm. when I first thought pipes, I was like, okay, that's an odd concept because yeah. <laughs> you're used to like doing things in like multiple brackets and all that parentheses. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was quite a challenge. So for me, R was. R met its reputation that it's hard to learn. It's got a steep learning curve. Right. And, um, but I mean, having sort of used R for a couple of years, um, I think uh, it's gotten much more easier because mm. with all the resources that's available, uh, all these courses, these YouTube videos, you can make a lot of them. <laughs> and um, and uh, with um, basically with Tidyverse, it makes mm. things a lot, a lot easier. Yeah. Um, there was another thing that I wanted to say about transitioning from Excel to R was, um, I guess I could point out examples. So uh, back in when I was uh, coding using Excel VBA, yes. I think it's a norm to use some um, nested for loops, yes. basically a for loop yep. within another for loop. Yep. And that's how you would do when you're trying to, so in an Excel table, you're going across by rows. 
yes. um, looping for every cell. That's how you would do it. And um, when I first transitioned to R, because that's a sort of um, grammar or vocabulary yes. that I know, I tried to replicate that yeah, in R, yeah, yeah. and that was painfully yeah. slow. Mm. It's like everyone said this R is like the promised really um, <laughs> <laughs> savior to all these things. Why is it so slow? And then I realized I saw some blog posts, some yes. Stack Overflow articles, and R bloggers. That's a really good yes. site for a resource. Uh, people said. Um, it shouldn't be using for loops, it should be using apply and because R is vectorized. Yes. And well, at that time I had yeah, no it's idea. Like, what does that mean, yeah, right? <laughs> what, what, what's vectorized? Like it, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> new, new concepts, right? Yeah, it's new yeah. concepts. But once you got the hang of it, start to, to know what's unique to that language. You yes. Start to use the right grammar. Yes. It's like learning a new language, right? You use the right grammar. And um, yeah. yeah, that became a lot easier. So it's a hurdle to overcome. Yeah. So I mean, if you haven't got like the native um, language like VBA, you wouldn't learn. You wouldn't have those barriers of translating it and overcome that barrier. Yes. You'd be straight into it, knowing what R is about. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, yeah. But first of all, I gotta say it's really, really impressive that you managed to like transition. Like you basically just picked up code um, yourself <laughs> from off. Uh, Philosophy major, so yeah. I gotta say, very, very, uh, very. <laughs> so there's very a, there's with that. a big motivation, right? You save yeah, so yeah. much time. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that that's a key thing, and you know, I think there's a lot of people who actually use Excel today, and they can see that they can kind of see these kind of iterative patterns, and they want to like cut down and reduce their work, and yeah. so, you know, um, either they're using some features within Excel or they're like using some mm -hmm. VBA. Um, and then you know, the question is, like, even for myself, I also transitioned from. Excel yeah. before going over to R. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's different, uh, there's different concepts, right? So for mm -hmm. instance, you mentioned there's like loops and nested loops and yeah. to be able to, uh, to do things. And, you know, when you're working with Excel, you're always referencing like a row number, a column yeah. number. R1C1, cell the, references. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all these kind of cell references. Yeah. And that's actually not very robust either, right? Yeah. So, you know, if a new column gets inserted or deleted or whatever, yeah. then those, that code actually breaks yeah. really, really easily. So typically with R, mm -hmm. you're writing, I don't know, sometimes maybe 10 times less code yep. to do the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you're actually referencing a column by yep. name, yep. not by a number, yeah. right? That's true. And so, you know, uh, those things are really powerful. And then once you are using kind of the vectorized operations and mm -hmm. stuff, which I don't want to make it like seem really complicated, but a yep. vector, it, in the simplest terms, I would say for, for an Excel user, a vector is basically a column, right? Yeah. So you're doing this operation on an entire column, right? Yeah. So there's no extra, you know, yeah. you're not looping through the column. Yeah. Just you're just saying do this with yeah. the column, and then it it just it just does it. Could you also say like a vector is analogous to an array in Excel, maybe? Um, um, although yeah, although it's... you haven't got the concept of data frames in Excel, so it's yeah. I mean, oh, sort of. So. I mean, the data frame. Uh, a data frame is effectively, for an Excel user, I'd say, a data frame is what people think of as a table, right? Yeah. Uh, but with like named mm -hmm. columns, like named column table. Yeah. It's basically what a data frame is. And um, yeah, like each column, I'd say, is, is a vector. A vector is basically a, a single dimensional range. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but the, the nice thing about vectors is because, you know, like in Excel, the base unit is a cell, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Whereas with R, the base unit is a vector, yeah. Um, and so you're not dealing with one number at a time. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with a whole series of numbers yeah. at a time. And when you have all of the, uh, when you have a group of numbers, mm -hmm. like in a single kind of storage unit or a yeah. vector, then it's able to operate on all of those very efficiently. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. So, I mean, yeah. that's that's roughly how I think about it. And uh, I guess the the other concern that people mm -hmm. have as well sometimes like people moving over from say excel or spss mm -hmm. or something like that is um that they need to learn some sort of code and yeah. stuff as well right because you know like excel is point and click spss is point and click mm -hmm. so how do you make that transition over i guess for myself when i was transitioning from point and click to code yes that was when i was using vba because yeah that got me to the understanding that code isn't that intimidating. And yes. then if you're testing it out on the data, you can test it in small batches and see, yep. understand what you're actually doing. And then it's just the ability to visualize 
applying that operation on a wider scale. Mm. So uh, I think what's the, what's the what's the best way? Because because in I guess in in R, you uh, you you're able to view the data. Yes. So um, I don't I don't think for, well I don't think it's a huge struggle. I guess I guess it's I guess one really useful way of thinking is because if you're coming from an Excel or spreadsheet background, yeah. you have to sort of uh, understand understand uh, the analysis that you normally do in uh, the most uh, basic operations so yeah. like in excel you would um you would add filters to the table you would filter things by like um, what's in the column you yes. would maybe um pick columns and then you could probably like with a pivot table you can group by and do summarize and all that yeah it's almost like being able to um translate those basic operations yes and then knowing what their respective concepts are and are yes um yeah i guess it's it's almost psychological that you have to overcome that hurdle yeah. of thinking that code is intimidating i don't yeah. know what this huge chunk of text is doing yeah yeah no no absolutely so that's actually when i started to learn r for myself uh i was really lucky because i had a friend who yeah. kind of knew r and he kind of um showed me R based on what I already knew, mm -hmm. which was a lot of the Excel and database kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? Um, but if you went online like a few years ago, mm -hmm. basically all the training material available for R were things like statistics lectures, right? Yeah. And they're diving directly into things like vectors and matrices and yeah. all this kind of terminology that you would never sort of encounter from an Excel perspective. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's when I'm kind of made my course mm -hmm. effectively, which was, okay, Excel language, mm -hmm. right? This is what it is in R, yeah. right? So like you said, like a filter, well, that's the command filter, yeah. right? Um, if you're doing a pivot table, well, that's pretty much like group by and summarize, yeah. right? And things like that, yeah. right? So th those are the kind of- There are loads of also um, text to columns, you've got equivalents in R, yeah. and also like finding duplicates and unique stats, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was it data? data validation mm. yeah, you can remove duplicates and all that yeah yeah yeah, yeah um, so mm. but, uh, what uh what else is uh, a good tip for people moving over from excel so you were talking a little mm. bit about um scalability and stuff as yeah well. so let's talk a little bit about that because yeah. let's talk about what it actually means to mm -hmm. be scalable right yeah. because i think sometimes when excel users think about yeah. this, they're thinking, well, maybe it's just like, well, I don't have that much data or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And, um, how would you define scalability? Well, well, if we have to define it in terms of um, the data do, the, that we work with, which um, sort of I have to describe the data that we usually get because they usually come in terms of um, these usage attitude studies, yeah. so UNA studies. What they are basically are uh, really large 20 to 25 minute surveys that right. that's done um, usually online and uh, what they tend what they are designed to provide is a view of um, the, of a market landscape of what people's attitudes are what yeah. people's uh, behavioral or usage are of things and they are normally conducted not like certain surveys certain surveys are conducted like um, every quarter every month to track what's going on so these big surveys are not done that frequently they're usually yes. like every two or three years to give um, the company a sense of direction of where they're going at or what steps they should take next so um, a feature of these surveys that we work with is um, that they're usually really sparse yeah. So what I mean is that they've got loads of variables, loads of columns, right. but usually not that many rows. Yes. So going back to your question of what I think of scalability, it's not like, um, because these uh, these surveys are not done repetitively, so I'm yes. not getting like a, a time series data at all. Yeah. Um, they're almost different every year to accommodate what's a new emerging mm. topic. So in terms of what I think of scalability, will be analyzing subgroups within that sample. Right. Say you've got 5,000 respondents, but you could be grouping them in different groups. Say I would mm. um, I would like to look at um, young males, uh, older females. I would look, like to look at those with a uh, higher income. I would have different clusters of these people. Yes. And I could also define them in terms of, of their attitudes. Say if they're people who only 
shop because there's mm. a promotion or people who are really bought into um people who are really concerned about the environment say yeah. um they might be um a vegan so um you would have different cluster of groups of these people yeah so scalability for me is say if you're able to profile or analyze or understand um a certain subgroup of people yes you're able to extend that to those different um subgroups very easily yeah um, yeah you can so you can use to r to segment your data first and yeah. then take those segmentations and then reapply models to like each segment yes yes in precisely. a more scalable way yeah way, right and i guess it's also to point out that sometimes it's not sufficient to just be able to apply the same model to yes. every group so you have to account for a certain uh yeah conditions. so you may need to tweak the models but then you want yeah. to you still want to be able to manage the yeah. fact that you have lots of different groups yeah right and be able to churn them out um in a less manual kind of way yeah right? yeah and yeah. I, I guess because with r if you're writing a function you can um conditionalize the input so yes. say yeah. say um say if i've got a survey and if um, the younger population are asked different questions to the older populations, yes. you want to analyze them with different input variables at least. Yes. And I mean, if R, if you're able to write your own functions, you can create a condition, say, yeah. if you're younger, analyze this set of yeah. questions, if you're older, ask. Yeah. So, I mean, strip down to that basic level, it's not that complicated, but I mean, R gives you the facility to do yeah. that very easily. Yeah, no, it just allows you to automate that much more, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, you know, I think when I think about scalability, there's, especially from the perspective like of say Excel users, mm -hmm. I mean, even though that Excel has like a million rows, yeah. right? uh, anybody who's used Excel, like especially using the sheet-based model yeah. of it, realizes that once you get past like 10,000-ish kind yeah. of lines, and uh, obviously it just depends on how many columns and how many yeah. formulas you have, but you know, around about 10,000 lines or so, uh, it's already starting to run slow and you're already yeah. starting to bump up into issues. So with something like R, you can deal with millions of records and that's kind of mm -hmm. no big deal. Now, some people think, well, I don't have that much yeah. data. Yeah. It's like, well, but if you were doing something like a time series, yeah. you could just take all your snapshots from the last few yeah. months or something like that, slap it again, and all of a sudden you mm -hmm. do have a big data set. Now, but aside from like the volume of data that you yeah. process in something in R, I think it's absolutely kind of like what you've said. The fact that, you know, um, in Excel, you're processing, uh, whatever you do, you're kind of doing it kind of once. You're kind yeah. of doing it one off. And even when you're doing VBA, you're creating a process to do things and you can kind of create functions mm -hmm. in VBA as well, but they're not as, they're just not as flexible, right? Yeah. Because like you're saying, if you want to segment your audience mm -hmm. right and create a function which has different parameters that work for each different segment yeah um when vba it, it's just difficult to do that because you have to you, mm. you don't have data frames so yeah. you're working on like which column number yeah right and then you know how do you code that how do you yeah. code that in a robust way and yeah. you, you can't really yeah. right so so it's like yeah. very fragile i guess it's yeah an adjective yeah. yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And it's fragile, yeah. it's just uh, the code doesn't really make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're using a whole bunch of like match indexes and all this kind of stuff like that. Yeah. But then that adds so much overhead to your code, mm -hmm. which is not actually nothing to do with the business logic. That's yeah. just, you know, that's basically re implementing the plumbing yeah. and adding processing overhead to your code, yeah. which makes it run slow. Yeah. And well, I guess, as always, say, it's hard to read as well because it's yeah. very data unique. Yeah. in a sense whereas with our code say you can take somebody else's code you don't know what the data is but from that you can look at the logic and kind of tell what they're doing i guess it's harder for vba yeah yeah no, absolutely yeah, yeah. Oh. and um another thing that i was going to talk mm -hmm. about as well so we we're talking about um uh, you know how much statistics yeah. do you think you need to know to like yeah. get into something like r because i mean r is traditionally a, mm -hmm. a statistics tool how much statistics is a, is, a, is, a, is a good question. So I guess that ultimately boils down, boils, boils down to what you need to do. Yes. Right? Because if you're just focusing on creating word clouds, that doesn't require any statistics. Yeah. I mean, um, I suppose if you're thinking from an analysis perspective and um, 
minimally. I'd say if you're able to create pivot tables, um, that's no status. I mean, I mean, when I I guess hmm. if you if you ask that um, me that question, where the statistics come in comes in is when you're interpreting models yes. and whether it's a good fit, and that depends on whether there's a need for you to create models and uh, for the piece of analysis that you do. Yes, and also um, say from the market research perspective, when you're comparing samples, you'd be able to tell whether a difference is significant or not. You so that would be basic in, intro, hypothesis testing. Yeah, yeah. hypothesis testing, intro to statistics. Mm. Um, and yeah, it also depends on what sorts of conclusions are you trying to draw. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So I, I guess um, I, I guess the thing is, the point is, is it's really depending, it's not, it's depending on what type of work you actually need to yeah. do. Right? So there's a lot of things that people do in Excel and a lot of times people in Excel they don't really do kind of any statistics yeah. in Excel. So if you didn't do Excel um, statistics in Excel, mm -hmm. then you don't you could do a lot of those things in R without needing to know statistics either and it's yeah. going to be um, it's going to be faster there. Yeah. Um, but if you are going to learn statistics, yeah. then I think that R is a lot easier statistics tool. Yeah. And I, yeah. I remember once, like years and years ago, yeah. when I was using Excel, I kind of thought, because I already knew Excel, I kind of thought it would be a good idea yeah. to learn statistics in Excel. Yeah. And I, I don't know uh, about you, but mm -hmm. kind of looking back on it now, mm -hmm. I realized that Excel is an absolutely terrible tool for statistics. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, uh, it, it's just so much overhead to do... Yeah. And so much overhead to do anything. Is it like, because you can't specify arguments and parameters? Well, let's say you want to do, like, up until, like, maybe a, a year ago, you couldn't even produce a box plot, right? It was yeah. like a major <laughs> hack to be able to do something like that. Yeah. Um, and if you want to, I don't know, say if you want to do, like, a histogram or something like that, yeah. um, you can't really do that very easily in Excel. You first have to, uh, you basically have to do it in several stages, right? Yeah. You've got to be able to aggregate your... Uh, data and then do a chart mm -hmm. of it. Yep. Whereas, you know, that's, that's just one mm -hmm. function call yeah. directly on your data. Yep. And so you get to those things a, a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd have to redo that in Excel, like yeah. for every single column in your data yep. and stuff as well. Whereas in R, you run, say, the summary function or, yep. or one of, you know, sort of many yep. kind of functions to do that. And it's automatically done the summary statistics for every single column, yep. um, like straight away, yeah. <laughs> right? So you know, I, I guess one way, yeah, I guess one way you could say that because one of the concerns, I guess, mm. the motivations behind that question is, um, would you be doing dangerous stuff if you didn't know statistics in R versus Excel? And I guess the answer to that is, if you want to do dangerous stuff, yeah. any 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 method is gonna land you in the same dangerous place. Say if you just plug in a function and just show that number without sort of really thinking about what it mm. actually means, that's gonna be dangerous. But yeah. I think to use a initial T reference, R is like a car that trains the driver. Yeah. So um, it's almost like, um, say if you're running stuff in R, like correlations, yeah. because you have to specify these arguments. Mm. So it almost forces you or encourages you to think about what you're actually doing. Say, why can I um, uh, not show the missing values? Why can I exclude missing values? Mm. What significance is that adding? Mm. And then say, if you're trying to do stuff like sum without excluding missing values, it returns on missing values and it's like, okay, that's not right. So it's almost like um, a tool that also trains you to think more rigorously about your data. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I think that's, that's, I mean, if you're coming straight from Excel VBA, that would be one thing that's really new to you. Yeah. Because I think in Excel, you don't get that much option. It's almost all out of the box. And then you're like, okay, just plug it in. And that's the number. Yeah, yeah so. no, I mean, um, like I said, R was originally a tool for teaching statistics. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what it was built for. Yeah. Whereas um, Excel VBA, it's not actually for doing any type of data analytics at all. Yeah. Like, it's basically for automating Excel. Yeah. But it's for automating, well, Excel, yeah. PowerPoint, word all those kind of things but it's it's literally a way of programmatically doing the things that you do yeah. manually yeah in x uh, in any yeah. of those applications yeah. um through some code yeah right but it doesn't have mm. um so there's uh to be able to work with all those components yeah. you work with something called the object model basically yeah. right um and it doesn't have any of those data components in the object yeah. model yeah okay? yeah now i think it's also worth noting as well that 
you still use Excel and VBA for certain types of things. So I think it would be useful as well for people to understand what kind of things do you still use Excel for and what kind of things do you kind of much prefer R for instead. Yeah. So I guess one thing to also say is um, like when I use VBA, I use um, a mixture of Excel VBA and PowerPoint VBA, yeah. which um, which are, well, it's very similar. I guess there are yep. only certain bits where you have to adapt for. So you don't have slides in Excel. So uh, the reason I still use Excel VBA and PowerPoint VBA is very much driven by um, client requirements. Yes. Because, say, Excel and PowerPoint are still the common vessels which yes. which carry all the data or content that needs to be shared within stakeholders uh, of our clients. So for instance, um, say if we would create a PowerPoint chart, um, we might uh, add some um, com commentary or opinions and then add a chart in it. Yes. But also what the client actually needs is uh, he or she might need to adapt the content a little bit, uh, say uh, this is what our supplier did for us. So it needs to be in the PowerPoint chart so that they can easily edit and sh share around. So, uh, and in terms of Excel, that would be more in terms of um, creating what we call typing tools. Yes. So, an example of that would be a creation of uh, a segmentation or, or, or a clustering that um, classifies people into different groups and you have different input questions. It's quite easy to create that in Excel where yeah. you can take inputs and then out, out spurts an answer. Um, mm. And Excel VBA just helps us to yeah. do that. So it's just a very portable model, basically. Yeah, it's portable. Like if we were taking this to, I don't know, like a jungle and you're in your, <laughs> or if you're online or, yeah. and you're, I mean, I mean, if you're on a flight and you don't get any internet, you can see it. Say, I mean, it has to be quite, I don't know if that's the right word, it has to be quite foolproof. Like mm -hmm. um, if anything doesn't work like if the R server doesn't work if anything happens you can still run it yeah so that's like a, a requirement yeah so yeah, yeah no it's it's interesting that because I think you know we're talking about this as well but there are mm -hmm. kind of different solutions for doing these kind of things yeah. but you know a lot of times like as you mentioned a lot of people are familiar with Excel and so they like it in Excel yeah. the other benefits of Excel is that it's just very very portable yeah now how would you do some of those kind of similar things in uh, R well, you have things like R Shiny, which mm -hmm. makes it uh, where well, you can build these interactive models similar to you know what you would do in Excel. But mm -hmm. what's the difference? The difference is, is that the processing is still done in R somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the user needs R. Yeah. But if they don't have R, they need to be able to connect through to some server, like online yeah. or something like that. And it means that you need to basically buy yeah. or pay for some R server somewhere, which is some infrastructure set up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that can make it a little bit more difficult to do. Yeah. Um, now I think in terms of reporting and stuff, uh, you have various options like in R Markdown. Mm -hmm. And I know that you actually did some presentations on this as well at Earl last year, right? Yeah. yeah. On like um, uh, some of the PowerPoint libraries in R that, yeah. you know, like R basically generating PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, so there are some methods, but they have their they have their pros and cons, right? Yeah. So I mean, for, for the R Markdown example, the exa <coughs> example that I used in the uh, last year was actually a quote from a client. So what we had was um, we created some initial analysis in uh, mm. R, and I thought, why not? Let's try and um, use an R Markdown mm -hmm. export and see what the kind of things and all that. And what the first feedback was some. Um, all the analysis, uh, all the tables that's mm -hmm. in there, the charts, they look great. But is there any way you can make it look less academic? Because <laughs> you know, like uh, with the, one of the standard yeah. outputs with our markdown is it's quite late, late tech. Mm -hmm. So um, there's that. But I think one of the other, um, I think you mentioned portability. Yes. Um, I guess some of the concerns could be quite psychological, mm -hmm. which is that you're familiar with Excel and yes. you're familiar with PowerPoint. And then it feels safe to have something in that as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the reasons why we still use Excel and PowerPoint. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, think, uh, I, I think that makes sense. And I think there is... Um, so, in terms of R being able to generate PowerPoint, what I found in, in my experience yeah. anyway, is that R is a, a very much an automated tool. Whereas mm -hmm. when you're moving over to things like Excel and PowerPoint, um, they're not 
they're not really very automated at yeah. all, but they're very, very flexible, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can kind of move things around to exactly where you want it. Yeah. You can, you know, adjust an animation transition mm -hmm. and all these like little features, which would just be kind of really hard to do. And it doesn't really make sense to do kind of programmatically. Yeah. The programmatic generation, it, I find is useful sometimes if you wanted to maybe automatically update something mm -hmm. like a pack, which gets refreshed every month. Yeah. And then you can automatically populate that using something like, R. Yeah. or maybe something like, um, if you needed to not just produce one PowerPoint deck, maybe you needed to produce 50 of them, mm -hmm. like one for each department or something yeah. like that. Then those are the times where R becomes very, very efficient at yes. doing those kind of things. But what's the trade-off? The trade-off is basically that <clears throat> maybe you're not getting the exact kind of look and feel that you want. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do some like really, really big presentation, um, which is this one-off kind of thing, then, well, actually, you're better off just doing that in PowerPoint or something yeah. in the first place. Um, in terms of the academic look and feel, I find that um, I really like Flex Dashboards. That's kind mm -hmm. of one of my favorite things uh, because you get a you get a very modern looking thing. It's yeah. almost like a bit Power BI-ish, yeah. Tableau-ish kind of yeah. look to it. And the nice thing about it is it's basically HTML, so it's very mm -hmm. portable as well. So you can kind of get that portability factor that you get with Excel. But... The kind of other argument, I think, for moving to Excel is that when it's in Excel, people can kind of play with it themselves, right? Yes. So yeah. people can go to the source data, uh, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending, yeah. right? And then they can uh, effectively run their own pivot tables uh, and be able to do their own things with mm -hmm. the data. Now, if it's in something like a Flex dashboard, then um, the kind of workaround for that is mm -hmm. that you can actually add a download button so that you can have all your charts and graphs and everything, which you can have more options and more advanced charts and mm -hmm. everything inside a Flex dashboard. Um, and then you can have a download button to download the data. Yeah. And, and that's a nice little option because the you can automate some Excel output using some either some VBA mm -hmm. or using some R libraries. Yeah. But I find it's just a lot more work. Whereas doing it directly in R, say R Markdown and Flex dashboards, yeah is very very quick to automate yeah um and then yeah just yeah i suppose there's a well. benefit yeah and just on your point about the look and feel um because, so one of the requirements that i thought about it, that i remembered is that uh with like client outputs you sometimes need to have it so that it's in their own brands colors yes. and image so uh, it's something that can share okay. internally quite a lot yeah so i mean the ability to customize that is a requirement and I don't know if Flash, Flex Dashboard does that or not. I think, I think it might actually be able to do it better. Now, yeah. I, I gotta be honest, I'm not a yeah. designer, so I, I tend to avoid <laughs> anything kind of designer-ish. Yeah. Um, but like because it's HTML, yeah. you could actually just apply a style sheet. And yeah. so this is actually where it could be a lot more efficient because you know if you've done any web development or anything mm -hmm. like that, you can, add, you can have a standard CSS yeah. document, which is applied to like all your websites and everything yeah. like that. And you can t take that same thing and then basically apply it uh, to your Flex dashboard mm -hmm. because it's basically HTML yeah. output, right? So I think, I think it might actually be better. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. I think it would definitely, definitely be uh, valuable to look into it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, so what I thought about was some um, mm. your question about um, like uh, power, like how I would use uh, VBA and R. Yeah. And I think because in my current situation, like with the with the sort of client requirements that we have, we would be asked to have um, these uh, relatively larger PowerPoint outputs, which are like yes. a full resource output. Mm. And then um, when presenting, we would also have the more um, succinct or condensed down yes. uh, PowerPoint deck, which um, kind of tells you everything that's happening with the story with fewer words and fewer charts. Yeah. But it will still be useful for them to have a, a larger resource stack to look through if mm, necessary. Right. So that's where one of the requirements why we would need um, almost, well, not literally, but then all possible combinations of what the outputs right. could look at in PowerPoint yeah. charts. And that is, I think, where I use R to help me yes. do a lot of the work. So two of the main packages that I use is uh, Officer and MS Charts. Ne yeah. Never sure whether you pronounce that Officer or Officer. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Those are packages that let you um, basically read in a PowerPoint template 
so you could have it as a client template or your company consulting firms. All right, so we just ran out of battery, so just uh, starting up the recording again. So <laughs> where were we? We were talking about yeah, so using I was, I was like Office R. And, yeah, uh, so I, I think I was talking about uh, using Office R and using MS Charts to generate um, um, loads of PowerPoint charts. And um, which is a client requirement because they'd be able to um, flip through the PowerPoint charts when necessary. O obviously, the final output to them when we present it would be a more summarized deck, yeah. which um, tells them the story without showing them all the detail. Um, and having that resource deck, we would be able to then use PowerPoint VBA yes. to further customize or granularize any um, detail that we want to add into those charts. But the other point that I was wanting to make was, um, if you think about it, uh, say you've got a hundred deck, hundred slide PowerPoint deck, yeah. and uh, a dashboard that allows you to look at hundred different combinations of of the same chart. They're essentially two different things because I would think with a PowerPoint chart you can flip through stuff yes. and see what's happening and then pick the ones that you need. With a dashboard, you have to actually, you know, get the right input combinations before you can get to that chart. So it's kind of like two different products, wouldn't you, just, wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of interesting that, yeah. because I think with, say, something like Flex Dashboards, there are a few different modes. So there's one mode, which is a storyboard mode, which mm -hmm. is similar to slides, but not exactly, right? So you've got um, all these little thumbnails across the top, and you can flick through uh, kind of each kind of page at a time, mm -hmm. which is a storyboard. Yeah. Uh, another option that you have is that you have pages, so right. you can go through each page in a dashboard, mm -hmm. and that's also a little bit like working with slides as yeah. well. But I have to say, it's not it's not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Now, in my view, I think it actually looks a little bit more modern. It's a little bit more flexible as well, because with something like a PowerPoint slide, you have this kind of linear kind of transition through it, but you can't stop and go you know, what's that number, right? Yeah. Oh, what happens if I change this to something yeah. else? Whereas if you have a dashboard, right. then you can, right? Yeah. And that's that's where it's kind of cool. So I think sometimes if you can start to show people the benefits of that, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of times, you know, these guys, they're in board meetings and yeah. they'll go, well, what is that number, yeah. right? I don't trust that yeah. or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And they want to like pull up the details behind it. And then you've got like all these analysts are like running around in the background, yeah. like on emergency phone calls, trying to get the data out. Yeah. And if it was like right there, yeah. then, you know, I think that could actually be a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things. I think that's, that's a big thing for like all of this really. Yeah. A lot of times we just get used to, and everybody kind of gets used to things being a certain way, mm -hmm. right? So we're used to Excel and Excel looks and behaves a certain way. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're working with other tools, like either whatever that's going to be, whether that's Power BI, Tableau, mm -hmm. R, SPSS, whatever it is, they can do similar things, mm -hmm. but they're always going to be doing them in a slightly different way. Yeah. The look and feel of them is going to be slightly different. The way you do things is slightly different. The output of them is going to be slightly different. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that you really have to appreciate because if you, anytime, if you try and make one tool look exactly like another tool, yeah. then it usually ends up creating a lot of work and it's not, um, it's not the most efficient. It's not the most yeah. efficient. It's not yeah. the most efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I was thinking is, um, because because when you were mentioning that point about, um, I was, I was thinking there's a little bit of a clash of philosophies almost, yep. in the sense that when you think about, say a dashboard, yes. say um, because you can pick and choose and see which specific part of the data that you're trying to see, right? Yes. But um, if you think about the fundamental, uh, purposes of like visualization or. Mm. Not just visualization, but when you're presenting a point yes. on a slide, typically you would say uh, have a headline and then the chart, right? Yes. And then the head with that headline, you're trying to uh, make an explicit point. Yes. And that chart is supposed to, if it's a good chart, it's supposed to reflect that. Yeah. And um, say if you have data labels, you wouldn't want data labels yes. all over the time series. You wouldn't want no. it for everything. You just want that. You one. want that one that yes. highlights it. So I was just thinking, I mean, I don't know, it's sort of peripheral to what we're saying, but it's kind of relevant too, because it's like, um, how can, 
is dashboard doing a different job to that as well? And uh, say, how do I accommodate that function mm. of curating yeah. content without? You know? I think that's that's a really good question, actually, right? Because there are things which are very kind of automated and kind of um, you know like there's that dashboard model where you're like picking drop downs, mm -hmm. which is an option that you can push at scale, right? Yeah. You're not making that for one person; you're making it for maybe a thousand people, yeah. so that everybody can use the same thing. But if you're going into, like you said, like a PowerPoint presentation, you're in a meeting, then maybe you don't want that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what I was trying to say before is that maybe sometimes you, sometimes you do want to drill down because sometimes the execs want that. But mm -hmm. let's say they're just presenting and they want to present the research and this is what we found yeah. um, without having to necessarily drill through all mm -hmm. that. You can still do that as well, yeah. right? I mean, that's effectively, that's kind of the purpose of an R Markdown document, mm -hmm. right? This is kind of reproducible research. These are the steps, these are our conclusions. You can put arrows on it using yeah. ggplot and all these kind of things. Um, but like you're saying, sometimes the look of that I think mm -hmm. you were mentioning earlier, it looks a little bit academic yeah. you know, because it, you're looking at like a paper, right? Yeah. So like a notebook file um, or something like that. And sometimes it can be much more friendly to put that into some mm -hmm. sort of PowerPoint slide. Yeah. Now there are options to put it into PowerPoint like mm -hmm. you mentioned yeah. with Office R or R Markdown itself. Yeah. And there's also, you know, like R has its own slide formats and uh, different things. Uh, or you could stick it in a, in a dashboard as well, yeah. but a slightly different dashboard, a yeah. dashboard without the drop down menus and all yeah. this kind of stuff like that. Basically just a dashboard, which uh, has a storyboard in it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's maybe you could make it slightly more interactive. Like you can have the, the fancy mouse overs yeah. and, and, and different things like that. Like, Oh, look at this fancy chart yeah. and you can hover over it and, yeah. and, and those kind of things just to give it a little bit more of a wow yeah. factor, but still have it, giving this kind of linear story transition, which a lot of, uh, say, executives or, you know, mm -hmm. even if you're just presenting your research as well, maybe that's what you want. Yeah. You can still do it. Yeah. yeah. I guess, yeah, I think, I think that's a really good point. I guess, I mean, yeah. if you're summarizing the idea of uh, whether you should, which approach you should take, should yeah. it be like automating PowerPoint charts or should it be creating a dashboard? I guess it depends, right? So the first thing we talked about is the, one of the purpose of it, like who mm -hmm. is it for? Yes. Like, how do you intend to use it? Do you yeah. want to create information or make it easy for the execs to be able to yeah. drill down? And those are the design of it, which is kind of something that you can replicate in R. Like mm -hmm. you can make it look less academ academic and more fit for purpose. Yeah. Uh, but I also think that there's one thing I don't know if we've talked about yet. Mm -hmm. It's about the um, psychological thing, yes. like of that. Oh, it looks. It's a bit too um, programmer or, or data science ish, so it's not yeah. like um, it's not like something that yeah, a non, no. someone from a non programming. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I, to be honest, I think that things like flex dashboards and shiny applications, yeah. um, I think they're actually pretty friendly. They, yeah. I, I don't think they look too technical at yeah. all, but they do look different. So yeah. I think the bigger challenge is not that they look too technical, but the mm. fact that they look different. Yeah. So like I mentioned, I think that's right. Yeah. If you're looking at something like say Power BI or Tableau, which are like the new kind of modern tools that, mm -hmm. you know, these are kind of what people use these yeah. days, right? So um, it'll look similar to those and it's going to be very much the same, but mm -hmm. it doesn't look like a PowerPoint slide. And I yeah. think this is really the, the point that I was making earlier. People just get used to looking at things a certain way. Yeah. And, um, you really want to be able to go, well, what do you really want to demonstrate? Mm -hmm. And I think you just got to kind of sometimes be able to sit down and have those conversations with clients and go, mm -hmm. look, if you move to something that looks like this, well, one, it actually looks much more modern mm -hmm. and more fancy and everything like that. Plus you'll get these extra benefits of kind of interactivity, automation, basically all in the same amount of time that it would have taken you to do this once manually, yes. right? So you're going to get all of these benefits. You're going to, you know, like somebody, you don't have to worry about somebody forgetting to update the slide, yeah. you know, because you just click the run button over here and it's, that's done. Yeah. So there's definitely a lot of benefits to having something which is much more automated, mm -hmm. but being able to sell those to the client to go, look, I could spend my time like formatting this document for you, mm -hmm. right? But that's going to be, like actually a lot of time and it's yeah. going to be a lot of work to do that. Whereas I could spend my time doing this 
and it looks different and I think it's better, right? right? Uh, but it's just going to be, because this is the native format that this produces, yeah. it's just going to be a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I guess it's just one, one thing about like yeah. PowerPoint is, um, it's in a way it's like time down the drain because uh, mm. say if you create a PowerPoint chart and then yeah. for some reason ends up that's like the data isn't right. Yes. Say we need to wait the data to accommodate a new factor. Yes. Um, that slide is almost good as useless because you have yep. to re recreate that chart. Maybe yes. you can keep some of the formatting in but and all that. But it's like hardly reusable, yeah. but whereas with R because it's like automated, once yes. you have the form in, that's, you know, once you've coded that, that's not going to be useless even if the data changes. Yes, yes. So, And uh, I think it's probably worth talking about here as well because, you know, I get a lot of students who have like a lot of questions mm -hmm. about things like, well, how do I integrate these different things, right? Yeah. You know, how do you, and there's, there's probably a few ways and we could probably talk about this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, tools like Excel and PowerPoint, they have lots of flexibility mm -hmm. but limited ability for automation. Mm -hmm. With R, you've got lots of automation but sort of less flexibility on the formatting. Yeah. Now what happens, you know, this is the mistake that people can end up falling into sometimes. Yeah. Um, they may be not so familiar with R to start with mm -hmm. and they're very familiar and they get, but they get some of the automation, right? Because you know, with yeah. like three lines of code, yeah. you can generate like a thousand files yeah. or something like that yeah. really quickly. Yeah. Um, and then if you're trying to manually alter those in like a tool, instead of having to manually mm. modify one file now, now you have to manually yeah. modify a thousand yeah. files. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and that can, that's actually something that can become more work, not mm -hmm. less work. Yeah. So it, it's just something to uh, keep, in, keep in mind. Now. Yeah. I, I mean, just an answer to that question, to that example is, uh, I mean, from my perspective, because I do an element of that, but... I would mm. minimize that sort of overhead of doing a lot of manual automating by yeah. moving as much of the automation as possible to R. Yes. And also thinking really hard about what slides do you actually need. Yes. So uh, like if I'm creating that output by automation in R, I would probably filter out those useless charts that I don't need. Mm. Because with automation, it's almost easier to create more than less. Yes. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah. so I'll start off by creating a lot. Yes. And then just focus on those that I need and then manually tweak those. So mm. that's that would be my solution to that sort of this, this fundamental problem of Yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't it? No, it's, uh, yeah, it's tricky sometimes, but yeah. uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Ideally you you can automate everything, but yeah. It's for for business purposes or yeah, for practical purposes, that's how you would adapt, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Um, what else did we want to talk about? <laughs> uh, maybe uh, functions and gists. Functions and gists? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so. packages. <laughs> Function, gists, and packages. Okay, so yep. let's now talk about something maybe like a little bit more yep. technical. So some of the benefits of kind of moving to R is mm -hmm. basically this reusability, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of doing something once, yeah. you can do something. And often, like once you get familiar with it, it kind of takes the same time yeah. as it does to do it once manually anyway. Mm -hmm. But the real benefit is that you can start packaging it up into yeah. like functions and packages and, yeah. and gists and everything like that. So yeah, should we talk a little bit more about that? Like how, yeah, you, you know, like what sure. these are and how Definitely. you use these? So um, I guess the idea is that, um, say if you've done a piece of analysis A, you realize there are some functions or maybe a sort of an analysis process that's you're, that you're likely to use a lot in this analysis and but also in many other future pieces of analysis so you write that up in a function and there are a couple of ways of you know reusing that function yeah. so previously i had um i used this gists in github mm -hmm. basically it's almost like um, a cloud-based um not repository but uh a cloud-based space where you can uh, store all of your uh, functions and then ju you can just search and find your own function. So it becomes a library that lets you access your functions quite easily. And um, there are functions with the DevTools package that lets you directly access those gists. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing about that is because they're not organized like a proper R package. Right. So you wouldn't be able to, you know, 
you don't document it as well, so it's not right. themed. So it's almost like a, it's quite good for ad hoc analysis, say, if mm -hmm. you need to use it when you need to. Um, so we haven't done that. So what I've been doing recently for, for my company and like for my general analysis as well is to, um, because previously I've always done those in uh, GISTs and like in mm -hmm. random uh, functions which right. I source in my packages. So it's a little bit all over the place and uh, it's a bit of a mess really. So uh, what I've been doing recently is trying to do uh, package those up into a, an R package, mm. which um, if I divide them into themes, I can just load those packages up uh, when I need to. Yep. And then um, just, um, just, just use them, just, just reuse them. So what I found, because like building your own package at first sounds like really intimidating. So mm. uh, one of the blog posts that I found really useful was, um, was it Hil Hilary Parker's uh, pa uh, blog post, which was about um, how you can create a minimal package. Yeah. She, she made one which was about um, cats, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. so I- o Always good to start with a minimal yeah, example. Yeah. <laughs> And then it's funny as well because you can understand it. I think it yeah. was a function like uh, you can say uh, input whether you like cats or not. And so okay. if you say yes, then you're a good person. If you say no, you're a boring person. So, uh, <laughs> so it's quite funny. And then you yeah. can associate with it and you can adapt it to your own things. Mm. So I follow her approach, uh, started to create these packages and uh, I've uploaded them on GitHub. Yep. So they're not like fully cram packages. Mm. But what I found it, to be really useful is that it encourages me to um, document my functions and yes. to add these warning signals. Say if I've included missing values in my inputs, um, should I throw up some sort of warning and tell yep. me what I've actually done? So it makes me a better analyst and programmer at the same time. Yeah. 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 Which is quite good. So at the moment, I've got one on uh, survey analysis, mm -hmm. this one on time series analysis, one on text mining, because we work yes. quite a lot with open-ended text. Right. So there are like surveys which asks you, why do you think that? And people yeah. just write a bunch of stuff and then you yeah. analyze that. And then, yeah, and there's one on relative importance analysis, which I think it's something that use, that's used quite a lot in market research. Okay. Yeah. So. And um, what would you say is the difference between writing a package versus, you know, just kind of sourcing a file? So, uh, so I think, well, in my own workflow, I would source a file when I have a function that's very specific to that analysis, which I right. know has a very low reusability. Right. So say if I had to apply that to a different analysis, I would have to add some extra arguments in and make that really concrete, then I would just source it. Right. Uh, but if it's something that I know, like if I can, uh, if I tweak it a little bit, I can make it really generalizable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know if that works yeah, yeah, or not, yeah. but, uh, but um, then I would try to move it into a package. Mm -hmm. And also I would try to make sure that my package have certain themes on it so that they're not like, um, this is a miscellaneous package where I would have all the yeah, random functions everything in it. Kind of so, in there. Yeah. yeah, I start with the viewpoint that, start with the initial position that if I wrap this package, mm -hmm. I want to make sure at least like people within my team would be able to understand and use it. Yes. So it starts off private, but I mean, if we can develop for them, maybe it can become a wider package. But I think that's how we classify how I would organize the reusability of my functions. Right, yeah. right. Okay, so your functions, so you've got your own packages on, on yeah. GitHub now, which is, uh, yeah. which is very cool. And, uh, but these are predominantly for your team to do uh, kind of market so survey yeah. analysis, right? Yeah, so. it's mainly for our own like um, analysis that we, we use quite often. Yeah. So these would be useful to put it up as a package because uh, yeah. previously we've got these um, just random functions lying around and obviously people need to talk to each other to find out what's out there Yeah. and that becomes inefficient and it dawned on me, say, if I start to look into our package writing, I can make that process a bit more efficient. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's really good. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you know, for like a lot of people out there, like you know, trying to get your head around well, writing your own functions and everything. Yeah. Usually, basically, it's just your code. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you just kind of generalize it a bit, add a few parameters, and put in a, you know, like a, a reusable mm -hmm. wrapper, effectively, yep. right? Um, 
And uh, one of the first things that I would generally tell people to do is that usually if you're working within, say, a single organization and mm -hmm. you're working with the same kind of data sets all the time, um, there's usually the same kind of data processing that you need to do to that yeah. all the time. So probably one of the first things that you should build is, say, something like a data loader or something like that, yeah. which does all your data prep and cleanup for, you know, the, all the data comes out of system X, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, augment it with all the data and clean up from system B, right? And kind of mash those together so you can start doing your analysis, yeah. right? So I think those kind of things are um, really, you know, uh, kind of, uh, it's probably one of the first things you want to do, right? So instead of write, rewriting those scripts like every yeah. single time, you know, uh, generalize it and reuse yeah. it every time. I think there was, was there like a rule of thumb? I don't know if it was uh, Halley Wickham who said yeah. it or what, is that if you have to repeat your analysis three times, then write a function. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So even even things like, I know, like mm. um, the prior analysis chunks yeah. where I think we've mentioned earlier, is like if you filter a group by summarize or do some selecting or spreading or gather, um, you've got that sort of code chunk. You could just... If it if you repeat that process maybe a couple of times, yeah. you could just write that up in a function, yeah. and then it would just make your code much more cleaner yeah. and more um, easy to read. And yeah. say if you need to make one change, yes. you could just edit, edit the function and it applies the rest. So yeah. Yeah. there you'd be less prone to human error if you yeah. do it through functions. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the other thing I'd say to that, it's not just about you know, like, oh, I, I've done it three times or something like that. Because, you know, sometimes maybe think people might think, oh, isn't that a bit overkill or something? Well, actually, it's not just about that. Mm -hmm. It's also about the fact that, let's say you had one group by function, mm -hmm. right? But you wanted to be able to have the flexibility to say group by, say, city or something in one instance, and then group by department in another instance, mm -hmm. right? So you've got one function, which is more adaptable, yeah. Right, because as soon as you turn it into a function, you can add parameters to it. Yeah. Right. So then all of a sudden your code becomes much more dynamic. Yeah. So that's the other piece about it as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the other thing is as well is that often code can end up really uh, hard to read and disorganized. Mm -hmm. Like you know, maybe you have like a thousand line piece of code yeah. or something yeah. like that, and a lot of times you can well, just. What was it? The joke is that about it's yeah. a it's a write only code. It's like. There's a, there's a phrase which is a write-only code, which is that you only write it, but it's almost impossible to read because it's right. so <laughs> messed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Too long, then, you know, uh, nobody's going to be able to read it, yeah. right? So nobody else is going to be able to read it. You're not going to be able to read it. Mm -hmm. And I think this was another thing that we were talking about earlier on before. But uh, so it's an interesting one, this thing, this. One of the dangers sometimes, whenever you're building a model in mm -hmm. anything, right? Whether yeah. you're building a model in R or Excel, mm -hmm. the danger is is that you build something which is really complex, that you go away and you come back and you can't understand anything that's happened. Yeah. Like, you know, a few months later. Yeah. So you know, I think that's a a really important thing to kind of keep in mind. Yeah. Now with Excel. Where is the logic lost? It's yeah. lost amongst all the different cells and all the different sheets because you have to copy down formulas. And, yeah. you know, there's a real danger that somebody could override, like, one formula, like, somewhere in the middle of something. Yeah, or if they forget to lock a cell or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> That's it's, so uh, basic, but then it happens and then it causes a massive havoc. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> somebody copy and paste something over... Yeah. And, like, even with Excel, when you have things like data validation and all this kind of stuff like that to protect your data... Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you do copy and paste, you can override it, yeah. which, I mean, it's almost ridiculous how yeah. easy it is to override the, the kind of data protection in yeah. Excel, right? <laughs> so, but uh, one of the benefits with R as well is this concept of reproducibility, this yeah. concept that, okay, well, you're starting with a raw data set mm -hmm. and you don't actually touch that. And this is, again, I think a, a yeah. concept that Excel users need to get their head around yeah. is that... It doesn't edit the source data. It doesn't yeah. edit the source data it contains every single instruction to do what it needs to do yep. to the source data, but not actually edit it. The yep. output is separate. Yep. Um, and then being able to write that in a way that's easy to interpret, easy to maintain yeah. is, is something really important. Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, so going back to your point about like reproducibility, if code is hard to read, mm. then that defeats the really original point of why we want to use R, because R is about reproducibility like after a couple months you can still go back and know exactly what you're doing mm. 
so I mean, this probably just goes back to the some of the best practices in R. Yeah. Like comment your code and um, make sure your code's readable. Yes. And that that helps build it to the fundamental point of why we'd rather use code than point and click. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. But I think um, so. Let's go back to another point then, which is. I think this fear that people have mm -hmm. that, well, there's so much to learn, right? Yeah. There's so much kind of best practices and um, I got to learn code. The and multiple then I got to learn, best practices as well. Yeah, I got to yeah. learn all these kind of multiple best practices and yeah. uh, it is one of those things which can get kind of really deep, I suppose. Yeah. But you don't need to go that deep to get started, I think. And, you know, I think there's a few things that kind of make it easier for people to get started in coding, right? Um, now I know you had mentioned a few things like for Excel, like you've got things like the uh, macro recorder mm -hmm. in VBA, which kind of makes it uh, a bit easier because you, you are kind of pointing and clicking and it generates code for you. Yep. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't generate very good code. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. So often... It doesn't generate code. scalable code. It doesn't generate scalable yeah. code. Um, you actually have to... When you... I don't know. I find that when you record something with uh, the macro recorder, you probably have to delete... 80% of it and then yes, yeah yeah for instance if something that can be done by loop yes say if you're selecting one two three four five cells yeah. you can do that in a loop but then it exactly. does it five times in the code yeah but I mean for, for beginners that's a good start I guess because you need to know yeah. what's out there before you can condense it to a loop yeah, yeah but and, and I think that there was this um there was a study actually because one of the hardest things I think about initially learning code um, it's not that the concepts, like the concepts are actually pretty straightforward. I yeah. think a lot of the concepts, a lot of the people did, are doing them anyway, mm -hmm. right? But it's really the syntax, right? Yeah. So you have an idea, but how do you translate that idea into something that actually comes out mm. uh, on the page and yeah. actually does something for you? And I think that can be a real barrier for people, which is why people move to kind of GUIs and mm -hmm. uh, point and click interfaces, which can do things for you. So um, I wanted to point out as well that there are a few tools like there's, there's still, they're still being improved and stuff. Uh, there's, I mean, you've got no code tools like mm -hmm. Power BI and Tableau where you, you are just kind of pointing and clicking. Now, there are some packages in R, like um, ggplotassist and esquizzy, and there's another one I can't quite remember the Would name you spell esquizzy? <laughs> I'll write it down somewhere. Yeah. But, um, uh, basically, they allow you to uh, pick a data set yeah. and, and then just point and click the same you would in Power BI. Yeah. Now, just to manage kind of people's expectations, these are not as good as mm -hmm. something like Power BI. A tableau but yeah. the fact is it's just like the macro recorder with Excel mm -hmm. right you can kind of point and click and it generates the code for you and this is a really big thing yeah. right because you know it's one thing to do point and click but when you just do kind of point and click um, you can't parameterize it you can't mm -hmm. turn it into a function you can't tweak the code and uh, I don't know how much I should go into this kind of now but you can't do things like when you dealing with code there's a whole bunch of other benefits as well. Um, there was actually this really great talk by uh, Hadley Wittgen, mm -hmm. who was talking about why you can't do data science in a GUI, yeah. right? And he was talking about the, some of the benefits that you get with code yeah. as well is, um, well, you got things like version control. So mm -hmm. you can use things like Git yeah. uh, so that you can track the changes. Like every change that you make, you can see what those changes is and you can kind of go back in time. Mm -hmm. um, and from an auditing perspective, uh, a regulatory perspective, that's a really, really important, powerful thing mm -hmm. that you can actually go back to the code, right, that generated a specific output at that point in time. Yeah. Because the regulator is always coming back and asking for, you know, you produce me this, produce it again, right? Yeah. And so that's something which is really important. Yeah. Now, the other thing as well is with code, um, you can't, when you're using a GUI, you produce like a graph or a chart or something mm -hmm. like that. If somebody else produces one on the internet, you can't really just copy and paste that. You can't just kind of reuse the chart that they've done. Yeah. You have to recreate that for yourself. Yeah. Whereas with code, like if you see something that 
somebody else has produced that you like and think, ah, I could use that and I could adapt it. Yeah. You can basically take the code, copy and paste it, stick it in your own code yeah. and adapt it to what you need to do, mm -hmm. right? And that means you can come up with answers like really fast, mm -hmm. right? And that means you're getting the leverage of like everybody else's work yeah. to be able to do things. So my kind of view on it is that I'm more for kind of GUIs being able to lower the learning curve mm -hmm. of getting into code. But ideally, I'd like GUIs that generate code so that people eventually get into code because that, I think, is the way to go. So you think it's like, um, it's almost like stabilizers on the bike, would you say? Yeah, it kind of stabilizes stabilizes on the bike, right? Yeah. So um, now I was mentioning before, there's, there was research done by MIT, right? Yeah. So they found that, uh, so for anybody trying to teach your kids programming mm -hmm. these days, so I'm teaching my six-year-old, yeah about coding, right? Yeah. <laughs> and how do you do that? Uh, and it, it, the cool thing is, is that you can start to teach those concepts now. And uh, so you've, uh, MIT's got projects like Scratch. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but no. it's yeah. basically this no coding interface where you drag on blocks onto a screen. I've been, yeah, I've played for yeah. one of those games before. Yeah. So it's like, you've got things like if statements and for mm -hmm. loops and random number yeah. generators, but instead of having to write the syntax for it, you just kind of drag them on screen. Yeah. And you can learn all the concepts of kind of programming yeah. without having to know the syntax. And that massively lowers the barrier to yeah. entry. And so by the time, um, but the, you know, like the code is kind of there, right? Because the yeah. block is called for yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I, I know what you mean, yeah. because say like in like C and C++, you've got, the, you have to end every statement of like semicolon. You don't yeah. have to do that sort <laughs> of stuff. Yeah. And then with R, you don't have to worry about um, whether to quote stuff. Yeah. So because you're just doing chunks basically. So mm. you ignore those peculiarities of each language yes. and just focus on the concepts of code. Yes. Which are like loops and um yeah, if statements and all that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think that's a it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I completely agree with you that um using GUI to generate code, that's very good for learning um yes. coding because mm. from my own experience that's how I learned to uh, Excel VBA yeah. because um, it's very easy. To say I think I think that's when I've started to. So so the example of how I how I, how I first learned it was uh, I think you know when uh, when you're running a survey yes. that's what people usually call field mm -hmm. work. You have to generate like daily or monthly or weekly reports to see how yeah. many people were getting each uh, study. So um, so because we've got these daily and almost weekly reports which are very regular. Um, and then we have to format them so that we can send that to a client. Um, so what I did was um, I did I do my usual analysis. I record it in a macro and then observe the code it generates. Mm. And then I would refine that code so that it becomes something that's streamlined and I could reuse or you know adapt it for another project very easily. So yeah. that's how I learned Excel VBA basically. Mm. With PowerPoint VBA, because I don't think there's a macro recorder or for some reason it doesn't work anymore. So right. I had to transfer my knowledge from Excel to that. Yeah. But I mean, having that macro yeah. recorder function, I guess from my experience proves yeah. it's a really valuable tool for learning. I think that this was a really valuable talk. It was really great to get the kind of real life hands-on experience from yeah. Uh, our experienced our user marketing. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a really good conversation. I mean, it's like, that's one of the reasons why we like sort of go to these meetups and also conferences as well, because um, like we have different backgrounds and we use R in different ways and talking to each other, you always find out new ways of doing things. Yeah. I think that's always the best way to do it because if you end up trying to always write your own package and yeah. function sometimes, it makes it inefficient. So yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's so great that there's so many people out there kind of doing these things. And the more that we can kind of learn from each other yep. and go, hey, how are you doing this? Oh, that's really cool. Yep. And, you know, there's always this kind of new function, this slightly kind mm -hmm. of, this really great package and everything like that. And just being able to share your knowledge in that way, I think is just really valuable. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you so yeah, much no, for like you sharing for all your knowledge. Yeah. Me here. So I hope you really enjoyed this conversation with Martin Chan. If you'd like to get in touch with Martin, his contact details have been provided in the details below. If you found this episode helpful, please leave a thumbs up. If you'd like to develop your skills as a data professional, head over to www.datastrategywithjonathan.com. There you can get access to some free training, 
The training is designed to be suitable for beginners as well as more experienced professionals who are keen to learn the best new techniques that make working with data faster and easier. Included with the training is free downloadable resources, which you can simply add your own data to save you hours of work. I hope you find these resources really helpful. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.